Okay, good morning everybody, and delighted to be on stage with Brett, Peggy and Adrian. Um, we are going to have questions at the end, so please do send your questions in, and also a poll. So, the question of course we're looking at today is, do we need a declaration of digital human rights? Now I'm not going to ask our panellists to answer the question, because that would ruin the whole discussion. I'm going to ask them at the end. So we're going to talk about that, and I'd like to see your views as well. So Peggy, what is the current situation? What does currently exist to protect human rights? And where is that working? Where is it not working? Great. We have a, an incredibly vibrant, detailed human rights framework. I'd urge you to look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the consolidation, concise form of what that framework looks like. But it also shows you what level we're at. We've got a great framework that sets forward the basic principles and ethics behind these decisions. And ideally, it also is a framework that is universal. That's the advantage. It's not the US, it's not Europe, it's not Africa, it's not Asia. It's a set of principles that have been decided by the world as a whole. And so it's a great foundation for this conversation. Brett, where's that working and where's that not working? We start talking about digital human rights. Yeah, so um, we're at the, almost at the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, so we've had a lot of time to examine it and understand it. But what happens with digital disruption? What does the right to privacy mean in the digital environment? What does the right to freedom of expression mean? We're all posting content on Facebook, on Twitter, etc., on all the apps that you guys are producing at the Web Summit. But what does that mean in terms of our ability to upload it? We've got fantastic that right of freedom of expression has never been more powerful. We've now got four billion people online, four billion still to go, people who would never have had that opportunity to be able to express that right to freedom of expression, access to information. But we're also seeing se severe challenges, severe challenges to the right to privacy. So for instance, what happens with the securitization of the internet, um, the national security environment where, where law enforcement is able to access our accounts, etc. What happens to the, to the right to freedom of expression where we have content removal that's also taking place. So those rights are severely both been given a great opportunity but also there's significant risks and as we think forward how do we bring the universal declaration of human rights, those principles into the digital age and I think that's the challenge before us. Adrian, how do you think the digital age has changed the right to privacy online? Well, I, I think, in a way, the digital age has introduced the, the, the need for the right to privacy online, if you like. That wasn't a challenge that we were addressing prior to us, all of us, spending so much of our lives online. But I think it's absolutely right that what we need here is to find ways to draw from... There, there, is, there are more than enough declarations and expressions of our universal human rights going back to the declaration, which, which, uh, which Peggy referred to. Um, and the question is, how do we realize those rights in a digital context? And I think, you know, there's an obvious challenge. You talk about the right to privacy, but more broadly as well, in that very often um, rights are interpreted, at least at a national level. A lot of our tech and our information systems um, are borderless or, uh, you know, or at least uh, feel as if they're borderless. So there's a couple of challenges there. I think the first challenge, the first way we come at that challenge is, well, we've got to think in terms of those universal rights being universal and assert them as such and say that the right, for example, to, uh, to freedom of expression, including a free me media, free press, must be protected in every country, um, you know, whether it's the United States, where arguably it's under assault right now, or whether it's in China or anywhere else in the world. So having a more uh, aggressive understanding of the universality of those human rights, but then also I think leveling up um, the norms and the behaviors and the habits that we, that we need to establish in the digital age. And that's where uh, the, the, the contract for the web that Tim Berners-Lee mentioned uh, earlier this week and, and that has been, um, that have been so talked about here at Web Summit um, really comes in because that's about saying, well, there are things that governments need to do to realize those rights in a digital age, things that companies need to do, but crucially things that we all need to do as citizens. And I think by, by gradually or perhaps quickly leveling up and, and getting those, uh, those norms, those habits established, we have a chance of matching up the, 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 the high bar that human rights 
uh, set us with the reality of our digital lives. Of course, Sir Tim, um, he had unveiled that on Monday night at the opening of the Web Summit, the contract for the Web. What's been the reaction? Do people think it's needed, or do they think it's just another, t another set of principles on, on another set of principles? What's the reaction been to that? Well, it's been a really positive reaction. It's been brilliant, and so many people here, and actually just outside uh, in the next hall, I think, um, people are going to the, the Web Foundation uh, stand and adding their sticky, uh, st sticky uh, labels as to how, am how optimistic they are that this kind of effort can succeed. There's been a lot of optimism here. There is some skepticism, and it's understandable, which is that, oh, it's another set of principles, it's another uh, list of um, nice things to do that we can all agree with. But the crucial thing is that this is a process. We're at stage one. We've set these principles. There aren't many of them. There are, there are nine of them. They, they all fit on a small piece of paper like that um, for governments, companies, and, and citizens. Um, but the second stage is we have to turn these principles in the next six months into real commitments by governments, by companies, and by all of us. And the third stage is then an accountability mechanism that holds us all and each other to account for delivering on those promises. Peggy, can you, can you make a set of principles like that into a global agreement? What are the difficulties of trying to do that? Well, I mean, I think it's a perfect question because it's one thing to do it in the way that, that uh, the contract for the web is, which is a joint effort that is really a lot about education, about getting people to understand what the responsibilities are. If, and this is where the UN differs a bit from the tech world, if you're trying to do it in an actual treaty or convention, we would still be here, you know, five, ten years from now debating and, and looking at it. And by then, of course, the, the landscape will have changed. We don't have time for that in this environment. And so that's why it's so important to really think about what we already have and to bring it into those conversations. I have to tell you, I get so frustrated when I'm a bunch, uh, amongst a bunch of techies and, and everybody's like, we have these ethical challenges and we don't have anything to guide us in looking at these ethical issues. And the reality is you do have a tool and it's, I admit, not very easy, not very accessible all the time, but we've done a lot of work to try to figure out how we get behind these ethical issues through the human rights framework and it can help. And what we need to do and what I hope all of you can do because you took the time to come to this session is help us bridge that discussion bring the human rights and the tech pieces together because it does help us to turn what we currently have into something that's actionable in a tech setting. There's been a lot of talk this week at the Web Summit about using tech for good. Brett, is it possible to have some sort of global agreement that people will actually work together for that purpose? I think the concept of a global agreement now is actually the wrong question and it's, it's it, putting energy into that is like, like Rome is burning. Right? We've got to address what we have now rather than spending 20 years pulling together a global agreement. We see the development of artificial intelligence, but no frameworks around that in terms of human rights. How do we deal with the issues of discrimination in data sets? How do we deal with the issue of inequality through the, the opaque algorithm? A set of principles on human rights and artificial intelligence makes sense to me. A set of principles that deal with the issues of internet shutdowns. There's been 180 internet shutdowns this year. Three internet shutdowns happened in Pakistan the week before last. So we need human rights frameworks applied to that environment. A globe, big international global treaty will end up with negotiations between states that will provide a position which is lower than where we are already now. The question for me is about compliance. How do we ensure compliance with the international human rights framework in these niche areas of artificial intelligence, internet shutdowns, digital identity, which is the building block of the new digital, digital economy and of digital society? You know, governments all around the world are setting up these digital ID programs, which is your biometrics, your eyes, your, face, your facial recognition, your fingerprints into databases, no data protection frameworks. We have a right to data protection, and yet governments are setting up all of these programs. Look, you can change your password. You can't change your biometrics. If somebody hacks your biometric data, 
you, you know, you're in a very, very diff difficult position going forward. So I'd much rather see the application of human rights to all of these scenarios and then see compliance as well within them. And we're seeing compliance. We're actually seeing how citizens are using their courts to say, this is a violation of, of freedom of expression. Shutdowns are not constitutional and shall not take place. We saw at the Human Rights Council also a recognition that internet shutdowns are a violation of international human rights law. So let's prosecute for that. Well, how, how do you make globally for there be a greater recognition that access to the internet is a human right? Well, that's a question of whether access to the internet is a human right. I think if we could just, can I just ask a show of hands that people think that access to the internet is a human right? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there's, no, there's no provisions, right, within the international system to say that access to the internet is a human right. So this is a new right which is emerging, and perhaps, it, perhaps it's even a superhuman right because it provides access not just to information or to privacy or to freedom of expression, but to healthcare, to education, to water, and maybe even your right to life. So the international system, and I'm looking at the UN, also needs to evolve so that we see new documentation that acknowledges the emergence of new rights, as well as the application of existing rights into new environments. We mentioned um, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Peggy, should there be a right for people to have anonymity online? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at those issues, and, and I think that there's a lot that needs to be done in this area of, of free expression and, and online content. And to me, it exposes where a lot of that energy from our perspective needs to go, not to this new declaration, but instead to really unpacking what we need to do in the existing space. Right now, those decisions are being made by companies, let's be frank. And then sometimes governments are jumping in and trying to supersede those decisions, and they are doing it in an often equally unfounded and unthought through way. And what we need to do is, with all of your support, find a way to close that gap and to really start saying, we need to bring human rights into this decision making. And the right to anonymity is, is an example of that. Um, on the human rights side, we have some questions about how it would work. There are free expression issues. How do you resolve those free expression issues? Well, fortunately, we've done a lot of work on that, looking at where does the right to free expression, how does it interrelate with other rights? The best example of that is about online content. How far can you go? What type of hate speech should be taken down? What should remain? Right now, your terms of service are all you've got, really protecting your rights in that area. We think it ought to be not just the, the companies that are deciding that platform law, but instead we need an in, at least an industry-wide standard, and then beyond that, a broader standard that brings those decisions into a framework that we can all be a part of deciding and applying human rights. Can I just jump in, jump in on this? because? Um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the concept of human rights, but it's essentially traditionally understood as a state obligation. So it's a relationship between the citizen and the state. And so the state has a duty and a responsibility. But look at what's happening now. Like we've got all of these tech companies, including many of you who are here, who are coding for geolocation, for instance, or are, code, are developing terms of service. What sort of training do you guys have, or what sort of training does Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, have in human rights compliance? Well, the reality is, is that there's a new form of compliance or a, a new analysis which talks about the role of business. What sort of duty, responsibility to rep respect, protect, and remedy does the private sector have? And that means that it's not just about you going to the state, it's also about the responsibility that all of you in the room who are producing and building companies out there have to ensure that your customers, your clients, your users um, have their rights respected under your project. So when you're building your terms of service or you're building, um, you know, you're cr creating the kind of the governance of your systems, you need to have redress when somebody says, my data is not being protected by your service. You need to be able to respond to that. And in fact, you should have human rights by design. So build it in at the beginning, rather than when you've got 100 million or 50 million or whatever it is users are having to backpedal when you deal with the crisis. Yeah. Adrian, where do you think responsibility lies on that? Well, I, I'm, I'm with, with Brett and Peggy, and I feel like now we're, we're in sort of plea mode to all of you because <laughs> um, this, is, this is up to you guys. Uh, and I hope, you know, I know that there are many brilliant uh, engineers and programmers and coders at, at Web Summit. I hope that they're also 
um, social scientists and, and lawyers and ethicists and, and others who can, or, or those of you who are engineers, sometimes act like a social scientist, act like an ethicist, act like a human being, which you do, uh, and bring all of, the, all of your humanity to your work because these are not easy questions. You know, that right to anonymity versus the right to, of everybody to, to not be subjected to, to hate and to abuse. Um, we can all agree on the sort of the, the, the ends of that spectrum, but somewhere in the middle, there's some gray areas where we have to figure it out, and it's not going to be easy, uh, which is why, you know, the kind of contract idea that we're talking about gives us, I think, the opportunity to do that. But also, Belinda, just want to really reinforce um, what Brett said about uh, the, the other half. You know, we're at this 50-50 moment where half the world is online or will be in a few months' time. That's remarkable. Well, what about the other 50%? There's even evidence, actually, as Tim Berners-Lee uh, shared here a couple of days ago, that progress towards getting everybody connected is not accelerating, it's, it's, uh, it's stalling. Uh, and we may be actually stuck at that 50% mark, which would be a disaster for the realization of human rights. Uh, because if, if, if this right to be connected is a super human right, I'll take that, like it, um, then, uh, then it means that all of those other rights that we cherish, uh, not just those sort of uh, th those rights around freedom of expression and, and being able to speak and express ourselves, but also the right to to basic health care, the right to be able to earn a living and provide for our families and so on. All of those uh, are also under threat. So I think we've got to really redouble our efforts um, are, with a rights-based approach to thinking not only about the rights of those who are currently online, but those who haven't experienced a shutdown because it's not even started up, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask for the um, results of the poll, and I'm going to put the question to our panelists, do we need a declaration of digital human rights? If you can give your answer, and, and just one or two sentences to back up your answer, and then we're going to go to questions to get you involved as well. So the poll, do we need a declaration of human rights? The answer to the poll was, drum roll, 89% of you said yes. Okay, panelists. Brett. So that's exactly what I thought would happen, uh, which is great, is, is that I think the audience is basically saying that the, the human rights need to be protected, that there needs to be an international framework to ensure that all of these rights that we've talked about, um, you know, that there's an there's a international understanding agreement and compliance mechanisms. And so, but what we've been saying is we need all of those things, but we don't need a declaration of digital human rights because we've already got the universal declaration of human rights. It just needs to be applied. So, you know, that thing where it's like, maybe the experts have got it wrong. Like I would see us as experts who work in the space and like the people are like, so we've got this thing where we're saying no, and you guys are saying yes. I actually think in this instance, we're actually in agreement. It's just the format. Um, but as I said, like, I don't think we need to have a new one. I think we need to have the existing one applied and into particular environments from AI to shutdowns, et cetera. So. Okay, thank you. Right, so there's a no. Peggy. <laughs> yeah, what he said, basically. <laughs> um, no, for us, it's, it's not about like, investing our energy into making a new declaration. It's about how do we take what we have and apply it to answer the questions that you have. And I think there's tons to be done in that space, and that's where I'd love to see our energy go in the future. Right. Well, Adrian? This is now X Factor, because <laughs> you got three no's from the panel. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I absolutely agree that, um, you know, the, I, I think, and you, only you know because you answered the question, but where you were coming from, uh, that 90%, um, is from a point of view that, and, a, and a firm belief that these rights that we all expect for ourselves, for our, for our families, our communities, are rights that should be extended to everybody and they should be just as protected, maybe even more protected, in the digital age and in our digital interactions than in other parts of our lives and perhaps than in previous times. So let's take that energy and that passion behind, uh, uh, behind that 89%. That Has it gone down a bit? Did it, was it 90 a moment ago? No, no, it was 89. Uh, it, it, it was 89. Yeah, yeah. Was my yeah. eyes. Maybe I rounded it up. Maybe it was 89. Uh, but, let, but let's channel that towards making sure that we do protect rights in whatever way. Right, like I say, there's three no's. Did any of you ever say yes? Have you changed your minds over the years? I think that we actually are, we are saying yes. You know, like ultimately, um, in 2012, what happened was 
the human rights system looked at this issue of like human rights and they were like, how do we deal with it in the context of new technology? So there's a question that was put in Geneva to the body that determines these issues. And, and the question was, should human rights apply online in the same way as they apply offline? And there was a unanimous agreement back in 2012 that that is the case, i.e. all our human rights are equally applicable in the digital environment as they are in the offline environment. And that's what we need to work on. How do we make sure that that actually happens? Um, so I do say yes. I do say yes. I just say that it needs to be transmogrified. You know, like we're, it's the digital disruption of everything. Everything is being digitally disrupted. If human rights aren't being digitally disrupted and understood in the same way as the transport industry with Uber and accommodation industry with Airbnb, then we're out of date. So we need to we need to modernise. And I think that we are. And I think that this group of people is exactly the interface. Like the interface between new technology and human rights is the front line of defence. And that's where we're sitting right now. Mm. Peggy? Yeah, I wanted to come in because Oops, did I lose it? one of the things that we um, see is that there's a lot of talk in our world about, you know, is this the end of human rights? Is the human rights space shrinking? What's, you know, is the world moving away from human rights? And to me, these issues of technology and how we answer them are really the tipping point for that conversation. Technology, as Brett said earlier, is a tool that can be the, cru in the, the best way for us to actually advance human rights, to ensure that women and girls everywhere are actually able to have access to healthcare, to work, to um, what they need for, for their livelihoods. But it's also the case that technology is bringing with it some of the greatest challenges and, and potential threats that we've seen to human rights ever. So that's why we're here today, is just to say that that tension has to be a focus, not just for the human rights community, but for the tech community, and, and to really find a way that we can recognize that technology will be either the thing that allows us to continue progress on human rights in the coming decade, or it could be the answer to the question of, is it the end of the human rights project? Okay, I've got a question for you to move on, Peggy. Uh, there are so many human rights violations in the world that seem to go unpunished. Does the UN even have the power they should have to safeguard human rights? Ultimately, we're a fairly small agency, smaller than many of the companies represented here, obviously. We have the ability to, to raise our voice to make sure that when governments violate rights, they don't do so with impunity. So what we need, of course, is the rest of the world to come in behind that. And that's not just the governments, that's people. And one of the things that we're working on is how we better mobilize people to bring that pressure forward. So our job is to, to provide the platform that allows the rest of the world to safeguard human rights. Okay, if I could put this question to Adrian, what do you think the gender split in this room, as opposed to in tech overall, suggests about the challenges? I, ju I just saw that question, and, and it's a little dark from where we're looking, and I, but the, the, the point from the questioner is this is a much more balanced room, right, gender-wise? Is that it's a little hard for us to see, but I think that's what I'm seeing compared to the, the tech world. So what does that tell us? Um, I, I'm not sure. I absolutely, you know, there's no question that there is a very strong gender uh, dimension to this discussion. Um, and when we think about, you know, whether it's about actually getting access to the internet in the first place, women from our research in developing country, urban context, 50% less likely to be online than men, less likely to be doing certain things, whether it's uh, applying for a job online or, uh, or uh, expressing a strong opinion on social media. The research shows that there's a real difference between men and women in that respect. So it, I guess, doesn't surprise me that there's, uh, and it pleases me that there's a more balanced uh, group that are discussing this here. The worry is that, um, that it's not a more balanced group discussing uh, issues outside of this room. But I also just wanted to come in uh, on another question I saw, if, if I could quickly, yeah. Belinda, around, yeah. somebody said, shouldn't it be governments that sort of take care of this and protect human rights? And of course, governments have an absolutely critical role to play. But to me, it's a little like, you know, when we drive our cars or walk around our towns and cities and you've got a role for companies to, you know, to build cars that are safe and that, uh, that do what they're supposed to do. You've got a job for governments to set the speed limits and put up the signs and so on. 
But then there's what the rest of us have to do, which is not just play by the rules, although we've got to do that too. It's also to establish norms and, and, and behaviors and ways of working with each other that enable us all to get through the day and, and, and keep things on track. And I think it's the same here. Governments, companies, citizens all have a, a, a job to do to enable and protect those rights. Well, thank you. And one final question there for you, Brett, from Anonymous. Um, how do you make China comply with human rights when they have WeChat? <laughs> and we've got just the, 30 seconds. You've, so just the easy <laughs> one. Um, well, you know, this is, this is the issue. Like, you know, a quarter of the world's internet is in China, and we've got the Chinification of the internet. I think the concern is like, it's actually very, very difficult for us outside to ensure human rights compliance within China. I think the answer to China is actually India. There's another billion people who are living in a democracy in an open internet, and many of the decisions on India are actually in play right now. And many of these discussions will also continue, if I can, just at RightsCon, which is coming up next year, which is a conference that discusses, it's a whole conference for three solid days on these sorts of issues that can help with a number of the organizations and companies in the room to address some of these issues as you're building as to how do we ensure that we're a human rights compliant company and how do we contribute to ensure human rights application and enjoyment for all users, whether they're here China or around the world. Great, thanks much. Can we now have a show of hands? Is anyone in the room now who would say no, we don't need another declaration for digital human rights? <laughs> okay, you haven't convinced that many people. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and thank you very much to Brett, to Peggy, and to Adrian.